Welcome to KJV Cafe. Thanks for taking time out of your day to listen. Each episode of the cafe is dedicated to studying the Bible verse by verse from Genesis through Revelation. Your host here at the cafe is Bible teacher Clark Covington. Looks like the coffee is hot and ready, so let's get started. Amen. Glory to God. Welcome to the program. Welcome to the cafe. Pastor Clark Covington here with another episode of, I was going to say Bible. Co- Why was I going to say Bible college? I have no idea. In my mind, I was like, I'm going to say Bible teacher. And then I almost said Bible college. Another episode of KJV cafe. And no, this is not an accredited class. It's a Bible study. Whew. All right, here we go. Okay. This is going to be a good episode. I can tell we're not going to edit that out. We'll leave it in here. Amen. Hey, we're here looking at Genesis 19. We were on uh, verse 8 in the last episode. We're going to move on to verse 9. And let's look at verse 9. And then let's just, I'm, I'm going to ask you a question here about modern day life. Okay, just let's see here. Verse 9 of Genesis 19. And they said, stand back. And they said again, Okay, so 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 Genesis nineteen eight is when Lot's offering up his daughters, his virgin daughters, f- to the gang rapists from all quarters of the city, young and old, to take them right. And Lot says, "Stand back," or excuse me, and uh, and and Lot says, "Don't do anything." And so they said back to him, "This is the 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 multitude, the gang, the community, the people at his door." They said, "Stand back." And they said again, this one fellow came in to sojourn. So their response to Lot for offering up his virgin daughters for their lusts was to stand back, get back. Like they rejected that offer. Okay. And they said again, this one fellow came in here to sojourn and he will needs to be a judge. So they're pointing out that Lot, if you remember, His herders, Lot's sheep herders and Abraham's sheep herders were getting in arguments and stuff. They had too much abundance, which led to a whole series of KJV KJV Cafe episodes on the dangers of having a lot and the perils of being rich. And we looked at court cases and the longest court case and in like the history of court cases dealt with someone that thought they were owed money and the Carvel case and how long that went on for and all these things. How money, the love of money is the root of all evil. Well, Lot then says, Abraham says, look, go to the left. I'll go to the right. Go to the right. I'll go to the left. So Abraham just says, you pick. Okay, I, we're, we're brethren. Let's not let's not fight like this. So Lot, he looks at Sodom. He said, this looks real good. He pitches his tent so, towards Sodom. He said, this is where I want to be. And so for a while there, he's outside of it. And then he keeps kind of being tempted by it. And then he's inside of it. And now he's living there. And then at some point, you know, they're abducted and they go through the invasion. And Abraham has to rescue them. At that point, you would think Lot would go and live with Abraham and repent and be like, I should not be around these people. I should not, there's nothing but wickedness here. There's nothing but death, but instead Lot goes back to that city. And now he's in the gate, which could infer that he had some status in the city. At the very least, he was able to sit there and welcome visitors. And that's what he was doing when the angels came. And the people are pointing out rightly that you were just like a a, a traveler, a transient, a passerby. And now you're judging us, you know, which is true. He was saying, don't do this. Don't do so wickedly. Now will we deal worse with thee than with them? So they have made a pledge to not only do whatever they were going to do to the angels, which they've already said they want to know them. And they already have made it look very apparent that it was going to be a forcible knowing of them. But now a lot also too has been uh, told of what's going to happen to him. And they pressed sore upon the man, even lot and came near to break the door. Now, This is something I think that is inherent in all of us. We, you know, have personal space and we have a right, if we, if you will, or at least in our minds, we have a right to that personal space. And when we physically are pressed upon, that is kind of like, um, I don't know what the word would be, but it it is a, I guess, warning, um, fight or flight moment of like uh, passing no return to some level of violence occurring, right? And so 
Uh, and you could just think of, you know, you're a tough guy and you're out and about and someone nudges you. They hit you on the shoulder and you say, hey, you know, and that often leads to the fight or whatever. So they're violating his space. They're pressing sore upon him. They came near to break the door. OK, and that's where we are. And I w- I'm going to take a break here and then we're going to I'm going to ask you a question and I want you to think about it. So just stay tuned. You're listening to KJV Cafe. We encourage you to look us up on your favorite podcast app and subscribe to our channel on YouTube. Now let's get back to some more in-depth Bible study. So we see here that, you know, just taking a step back and looking at Genesis 19, reading it, you know, uh, more, um, less verse by verse, more just thematically. You know, obviously the men of Sodom have let their desire get the best of them. Obviously, um, they felt entitled. Obviously, this was something getting to the point where they're physically, you know, borderline assaulting someone and promising to assault and do other things to to others. At what point do we realize that, you know, maybe getting into sin will be something we can't come out of, you know? And like, why do we have to wait until the fire is raining down from the sky to say, "Uh oh, God, help me. Like, why is it that the plane needs to be crashing before we call out to God or the boat needs to be sinking? And this is what I've referred to as SOS. I won't even call them Christians, but just SOS prayers from people that want to be Christians. And there's a mentality that is I don't know if taught or the, the, you know, the devil's called very uh, subtle, right? Be subtle beyond, you know, all creatures in Genesis. Um, that subtlety that comes out where it's like, hey, you know, okay, well, God may be real. Maybe that's what the devil wants you to think. Confuse you, the author of the confusion. But don't call on God until essentially there's nothing else you can do right? Take everything into your own hands, be your own master, go do what you want to do, chase your passions, all of these things, but don't call out to God until there's just nothing else you can do. Then call out to God. Because the Bible clearly says God will not hear the prayer. The Bible says God is far from the wicked. Uh, The Bible speaks to all of these ideas that God will not hear the prayers of the wicked, that God hears the prayers of the righteous, that God's near the righteous, amen. Uh, Jesus in the Beatitudes in Matthew speaks of blessed are the poor in spirit, the contrite in heart, essentially people that know their condition, right? And so that they don't have to wait until they're realizing their condition. Uh, Certainly the men are about to be struck blind in a verse or two here. That might wake them up a little bit. Or maybe when the fire is coming down and they're watching everything burn up, but by then it's too late. And so the question is, can you look around here today in your life and say, you know what, there's something I see that I need to get away from, from, that I need to give to God, that I need to step back and deal with before it's too late. And I'm like these depraved lunatics in Sodom, right? Because nothing has changed. Absolutely nothing has changed. And I won't go into great details, but when I was living in the world, and oh yeah, I lived in the world for a season. I mean, my kids will ask and I'll tell them, you know, hey, there's nothing that you can get into that I ha- that, that your dad hadn't been into and uh, pretty much. And I've seen it all and pretty much done it all. So if there's anything that you're curious about, I'll save you all the heartache, misfortune and terror. And I'll just, you know, I could, I could tell you why it's terrible and, and save you that because God is so good and we just want to live for God. Be of a sober mind on and on. But being in the world, I, I was in some places and, and I don't know exactly how I ended up there or why, but you see that, you know, behavior come out where you just see just the lawlessness, just the, 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 the lust of the flesh, just the, the depravity of man on full display. And at that point, I think even for the strongest individual, it's too late, right? You know, among these people, there was old and young. I mean, there was people probably that that had a good education there. There's people that had good jobs, good standing in the community, whatever it was, right? And it was too late. They couldn't help themselves. They had fallen so deep into sin. So when we understand that God's judgment on Sodom 
wasn't like God was just checking that off the list saying, okay, I burned one down. Now I got to burn, you know, 50,000 other little towns down. No, God was doing that as an example saying, here's an example. Here's what happens. Cause God said in his word, the wages of sin is death, but people aren't abiding by that. Right. And, and, and God's given us the principles here today and people still aren't abiding by it. And so God says, okay, I'll show you what happens when man in his depraved state, in his sinful state, gets a hold of this lust and can't help it and goes crazy, they're going to be, face this judgment and they won't be able to rationally come back from it. The idea that I heard a brother say one time is that without being held by God, held in the hand of God, we cannot do anything right, right? And I agree with that. Like, if I am holy today, if I pray in the morning and read my Bible, or, you know, I pray in the evening and read my Bible, pray in the afternoon, if I'm uh, serving the Lord in some kind of ministry, if I'm sharing the gospel with someone, if I'm holy today, it's not within me, the natural Clark, right? It is within the Holy Spirit, who is God, and it's he living in me that does that. So God doesn't want to use you in your natural state. He wants to work through you in his power through you, right? So you are simply a vessel, right? And that's it. You know, you're a vessel either for, for glory or destruction, right? You're one or the other, uh, but you're not, you're, not, uh, you're not both, right? Because you can't be both. You know, you've got to be one or the other. And that is the point. You know, we see Romans uh, 9, 22 through 23. What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had afore, uh, prepared unto glory? And so we see here that, that there are vessels of wrath, right? There are uh, Pharaoh, for example, you know, with Moses, he was hard hearted, right? He didn't want to let them go. Uh he, he didn't allow them to leave the Israelites and God hardened his heart. God raised him up so that he could then show his power to deliver the Israelites from that sinful bondage, right? Uh, verse 21, hath not the po a potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor, right? Uh, you think about uh, Esau, right? And Jacob, right? You had Esau, God hated one and he, and he loved the other. He loved, he, he hated one as it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Romans 9, 13, the New Testament reference, amen. Uh, Malachi verse one, or excuse me, Malachi chapter one. And I hated Esau and laid uh, his mountains and his heritage waste for dragons of the wilderness. He loves Jacob. So we see here this principle that God is in full control and God has the power to make a vessel to honor or dishonor. And we, in our pride and foolishness, think we have the power to do anything when God has all power. So our prayer shouldn't be, God, keep me holy. God, keep me great. Our prayer should be, Lord, I'm a sinner. Help me. Lord, help me to not fall in to these sins because I am from the dirt. I am a, a descendant of Adam. I am uh, in the flesh. I do live in the carnal world. You see how humility and how living for God, it goes hand in hand and how God hates the proud. I mean, God made us all. So he knows how inferior man is and how they get puffed up. And then God says, are you kidding me? Right? And these people were very proud, arrogant, ignorant, and they were facing certain destruction and their destructions memorialized for an eternity in God's word. And so we see here just the, both the, the foolishness of man at that time, but also the danger for us today, if we're not careful, that we too can fall into sinful lusts that we can't get ourselves out of. And the one that delivers us from these temptations, the Bible says that God will not suffer us to be tempted more than we can bear, that he'll provide a way. The one that will deliver us, Jesus Christ, our Savior, needs to be our priority when often he isn't. So let's make him our priority. Let's turn to him for deliverance so that we don't end up like these in Sodom, the Sodomites. Okay, tune in next time. Take care, God bless, and amen. Thanks for spending time with us today at the cafe. We would love to hear from you. You can email Brother Clark directly at clark 
at EnduringPromise.org. See you again tomorrow, same time, same place.